No, it can't end like this. There's too much left to fight for. I haven't been a hero yet. We're going 90s today. Witchblade. Spawning out of the image revolution and the company spawned thereafter. Also, yes, Spawn came out of this era too. Witchblade is an interesting property, one that is oft overlooked and sometimes memory hold, despite the fact that it has a fairly large reach, or had one for a time. There's a TV series, an anime, a manga. Witchblade was published by Top Cow Productions, which was found in 1992 by Mark Silvestri. It is an imprint of Image Comics. Witchblade was the result of the company moving into the fantasy genre in the mid 90s. The first issue was published in November of 1995. The story was a joint effort between Michael Turner, David Wall, and Christina Z, and this was very much collaborative, particularly at the start. The series credits five people with its creation, which aside from the three mentioned also include Top Cow founder Mark Silvestri and Brian Haverlin, who did the first cover alongside Turner. Turner did the pencils in this issue alongside Wall. Michael Turner had been discovered by Silvestri at a convention, he hired him on the spot. He was doing backgrounds, and this series was his breakout. There were even more people involved, I'll put them up here. There were a lot of people working on Witchblade. There was a real attempt to create something sustainable, something to compete. Image and my proxy Top Cow were making an effort to be a long-lasting comic book company, and in particular create some long-lasting creator-owned IP. The earlier works in particular are steeped in this conviction. Now Witchblade, the story of a sentient gauntlet that initially attaches itself to hot-headed loose cannon police officer Sarah Pizzini, can oftentimes get dismissed for the sheer 90s-ness of the affair. The 90s in comics, as indeed the 90s in general, tends to be a time period that is both overly mythologized and overly reviled. It can be held up simultaneously as the best period or the worst period, depending upon who you're talking to. The reality? It was a period like any other, with highs and lows and its own art styles and tropes in the same way any era has. There is a uniqueness in the fact that there does come a sudden expansion brought on by artistic exoduses. So you may get some more unique properties around this time, but there have been other periods in history where there have been indie booms as well. This time period stands out because some of them do make a lasting impression. But how does Witchblade hold up, or does it? Well, let's take a look, really look at it. Not just tossed out because it has cake, lots of it. We got sweet and beef. I'm Sasha and this is Casually Comics, and before we talk about Witchblade, we gotta talk about another kind of blade. This video is brought to you by Kamikoto. Kamikoto makes great great Japanese steel kitchen knives using traditional techniques. They're slick, they're sharp, they come in their own carrying case. They're in a heavy duty ash box so you can class up your kitchen and they make a great gift for your loved ones or yourself. Love yourself. Always love yourself. Each knife is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. These Japanese steel knives are used by Michelin star chefs all over the world. So you can role play that you're serving your own Michelin level food. Maybe you are, I don't know how well or not you can or can't cook. These knives date back to the Edo period in Japan and only use steel sourced from mills in Japan. They're authentic and have a good grip, meaning that these knives have a long history, centuries of tradition, and now you can enjoy them in your own home. They feel good in your hand, and that matters. They have a wide range of products to choose from on their site, so you can find knives that best suit your needs or style. Or you can be like me and just use the knife that's closest to you. Kemikoto has several special offers going on right now and is offering my viewers an extra $50 USD off any purchase with discount code CC50. On top of our special offers, you will have your own landing page, which you can see right here. It's kemikoto.com slash CC50. So if you're interested, click the links. I'll have them down below. Now back to the other type of blade, not for cooking. Now that you're ready to slice up your meat, just like which blade slices up. The cover for the first witch blade has a watercolor feel to it. It features Sarah and her garb as witch blade when the blade does its whole sentient organic armor thing. She's awkwardly leaning against a gargoyle. Resting, posing more like it. It's not the finest or most eye-catching cover out there. It's got the cheesecake factor with the armor looking a bit ripped and of course assets being exposed, and the weaponry looks a bit intriguing, enough to raise an ooh, what's going on? But overall the colors are a bit muted and the pose is more pin-up than action hero. As time would go on, Witchblade would have some iconic covers that would fuse the two concepts. Coarse miles may vary, some may love the relative softness of this cover. Apparently contrast with later ones. Again, there's a kind of painterly aspect to it. It almost looks like a piece of heavy metal art, so I can see some going for that. The Witchblade Blade has some strong Giger and Species vibes going on. And Species did come out in 1995. You created a monster, now you want us to kill it. Come on, who else remembers Species? Don't leave me hanging. There were four of them. I can't be the only one who saw all of them. We open in New York at 5.45 p.m. Witchblade loves to tell you where you are and what time it is. Here we see Kenneth Irons. The narration box in this issue are plentiful, largely because it's trying to establish a lot of things, but also there's a tonal aesthetic to it. This book is going for a bit of a fantasy neo-noir fusion, so you have that kind of grizzled, hard-boiled narration at points. Touted as Fortune Magazine's Entrepreneur of the Year, Irons used his shrewd business acumen and cutthroat ethics to enable his pet product Project Irons International to attain status as a Fortune 500 company in no time. But Irons' entrepreneurial spirit didn't stop there. 
if you include its exploits in drug trafficking, prostitution, slavery, and weapons production. Into Irons International's gross earnings, he'd officially be one of the 10 richest men in the world. Yeah, Kenneth Irons doesn't just do some of the bad things, he does all the bad things. He also has a villain room full of beautiful art and artifacts, but none fasten him so much as one that he keeps hidden under a red cloth. We get some ominous narration here about how he's already been rejected by it, how he's in kind of an abusive relationship with it, how he won't let it go, and how he's vowed that one day he'll find a person who can wield it. Even though he knows he can never have it, Irons has seen a hint of its power, and that's enough to endure a lifetime of ardor and pain. Then I will own you both. At the same time in Chelsea, we're introduced to Sarah in a sleazy getting ready montage. As she gets into a dress I'm pretty sure is PVC, that stuff is sweaty. I wouldn't want to go undercover in that. Her boxes are in first person narration, so we get a better sense of her voice directly. Even when I was a little girl, I knew I was going to be a cop. We get some backstory here, how she grew up playing Starsky and Hutz with her friend, but now she's the real deal and she's willing to bend the rules, particularly if it's a little personal. She needs to get results when the system fails. All the 90s action tropes, all of them. The cannon might be loose, but the dress is tight. I work in a system that favors the guilty, whether they're double murderers in LA or conniving drug dealers here on my beat. As long as they have the cash, they'll walk. Unfortunately for the latter, money doesn't always talk loud enough. Starsky never had to do this to make a bust. That's meant to be someone looking through an eye hole or peephole getting an eye full. Now this scene is meant to be, of course, that she's putting on a distracting disguise. It's also framed for maximum tissue box beside your bed enjoyment. Miles will vary whether that bothers you or not. Some can't get with it and find it exploitative. Others enjoy it or don't mind having no strong feelings one way or the other. Or some feel, depending on the circumstances, it can fit the tone of the world or the style that is in play. Let's see it all together. I don't know. I'm not nuts about the gloves or the tiny tinted glasses. Sarah's here to pretend to buy some drugs. This dealer ended up getting one of her childhood friends killed, so it's personal. Her partner Yi is there undercover, and she has to maintain her cover, and they ask her to pistol whip him, and she does. Mm, such a handsome face. Too bad. But then she instantly breaks character the next moment anyway. Poor Yi. The pistol is like a part of my hand. With it, I'm a superhero. Note that. It'll matter later. Recognize me now, you piece of sh**. Oh, you flatter me. Of course I was on your murder case. You killed a friend of mine during your last turf war, Maria Bazanis, who stupidly thought she could take an afternoon stroll with her daughter. You showed her, didn't you? And you showed her a kid who stood and watched her mom bleed to death. Your lawyers aren't going to get you off this time, Gallo. I'm gonna enjoy watching you bleed. The rest of the police show up before she can go full dirty Harry mode though. Did she fire six shots or not? We're next introduced to the idea that Irons is holding a tournament. This is the narration box of a once powerful mobster who has been forced out. So if you like stories where you get character perspectives who don't seem to matter at the moment and may or may not later, this page is for you. If not, it may feel unfocused and you may have wished that it was just another Ken page. Sarah is getting chewed out by her captain and eyed up by internal affairs for you know all of the rules that she just broke. But the captain pulls her aside. He's actually fond of her. Like a daughter. Which means that she just gets to ignore police rules and procedure. But you're getting reckless and that scares me. Okay, come on. I'm taking you off the case. Only he doesn't. She's at least apologetic for beating her partner, who has a lovely 90s ponytail, complete with tendrils. They next interrogate one of the men from her raid, and she's full on ready to, and it seems like does torture him for information. And she gets the location of Irons' tournament. For who can wield the Witchblade, even though she doesn't know that that's what it's for yet. But before they go there, they've got one more subplot to stop at. Murder. In Greenwich Village at 7.19pm. Her and Yi head to a scene where they find a woman burned alive from the inside out. Only in no way shows that. If someone told me they'd embalmed her or something, I'd believe it. Still, this killing match is another from a week ago. And you know what that means in any one of these stories? A serial killer. Okay, some character development for Yi and Sarah, and then we're going to the tournament. What's the deal, Pez? I put my life on the line for your personal retribution, and you return the favor by trying to kill me? Relax, Michael. I was in control the whole time. Now, Sarah wants to go check out this place they got a tip on because she's convinced that it might have something to do with her murdered friend. After some light flirting with Yi, who asks if she really thinks that he's handsome, she says she's going in. If she's not back in five minutes, call for backup. I'm sure he's gonna listen. What could possibly go wrong? She manages to sneak in, crediting the dress. I'll have to send a thank you note to Versace tomorrow. This dress is really coming. Wait. What the hell is going on here? That dress is Versace? Thanks, I bought it at Versace. I have to look up what Versace was doing in the mid-90s. And now it is unveiled as Ian Nottingham at this point is working for Irons and his great hair reveal the Witchblade. The contest is simple. Come up, stick your hand in, and then you'll know if you're worthy or not. It's very Arthurian, into it. Irons is excited because the blade moves as we the reader are told it's scanning for its host and so twitches upon sensing her. Of course, the poor contender going up thinks it's him and for that he gets his hands burnt off. I wonder if people reach into the witch with their dominant hand. That'd be awful. But it's been five minutes and Yi did not wait in the car. He wanted to live his trope to its full conclusion. They bring him up on stage and they're gonna do some extra show with him, but he says just to kill him. So Ian says fine and they open fire. This page, the top of it in particular, is a good example of something that happens throughout this issue. Sometimes the organization of the speech bubbles or narration boxes can be a bit counterintuitive. Your eyes want to go one way or rather have been trained to or being led that way across the page based on the layout, but actually they're supposed to go somewhere else first. 
I would occasionally find myself having to double back after reading the wrong dialogue box and then realizing, oh, that came after. Sarah tries to dive in front of you to save him, but that just means they're both shot. And as she's laying there reaching for something, anything, the Witchblade reaches out for her. No, it can't end like this. There's too much stuff to fight for. I haven't been a hero yet. The Blade joins with her and we see her thoughts thinking about how she has to fight and her joy at being alive transformed to something fused with the Witchblade. I am an angel of death. I am power. This is freedom. You are everything I thought you'd be, Witchblade. And I'll possess you as I meant to. Welcome back. Gross. Sarah manages to get herself under control in time for you to die dramatically. Man, he went through a whole movie arc in about a few pages. R.I.P. Ye. You embodied the partner who has to die sidekick role perfectly. Do you still think I'm handsome? Yeah. Yes, I do. Don't worry, there'll be many more handsome people. Look at Ian at the end of issue five. When I was a little girl, I wished I had the power to mow down all the people I thought were bad so none of them could hurt me. Now somehow I have that power and I'm scared. This is a nice contrast to how she felt about her gun earlier in this issue. Both the gun and the Witchblade are weapons, but the gun was tied to her childhood fantasies. And there's still a level of her playing hero when she used it. As she says, oh, I'm a superhero when I use it, when she's dying, she says she hasn't been a hero yet. The Witchblade is something else, something darker, and despite supernatural origins, within the context of the story, something more real. So it's a whole other level, and that frightens her. But we also know that she craves that kind of power. So it's something that she could grow to love, perhaps too much. It's a of an interesting dynamic between her and the Witchblade. And so it ends with the beginning. And that was issue one. This issue is trying to do a lot. It's moving at breakneck speed. It is action packed, color packed, cheesecake packed, just packed. It's paced similarly to an ambitious TV pilot that isn't sure if it's gonna get picked up. So it's trying to place every potential interesting threat in there to grab interest. So the pacing can be a bit rushed in points or a bit disjointed. The sudden burning inside out murder comes out of nowhere. And from loose can to Witchblade happens at breakneck speed, which at the same time makes sense because it means you get to see the issue ending with seeing the Witchblade bonded to somebody. It would have been a harder sell to get people to come back if you would say just unveiled the Witchblade but not shown it doing anything. Sure, the Witchblade looks cool on its own, but it's much more interesting to see it take over a person and see the full extent of what it could potentially do, or that it can do more than just sit there and be ornate. So having her transform at the end is a good hook. There are a lot of tropes at play here, and most of them are played straight. The poor earnest dead partner, who they try to build up a bit, but there's really no time to care about ye. Every cop trope pretty much from a gritty action perspective is there. And yet, it manages to pull stuff together into something interesting yet familiar. At least there's enough there to be curious about what's going on, and definitely enough to give it a chance. It has a pace and vibe, if one is willing to go with it, of a sleazy action movie that happens to have a bit more depth than you may have anticipated going in. And it really does. From here on out, it really picks up on some interesting threads, and it can get pretty deep on the character introspection. The threads that laid out, they slow down, it starts to build upon them. Overall, for this issue, there's an air of fun to it. And real effort, even if some of the beats are well-worn. The art, in my opinion, really works for this. This is Turner's chance and he's taking it, going all out, trying to show all the different things he can do. And as it goes on, while he's on the book, his style just refines. For some, it may be too cakey and they may dismiss it out of the hand or really not enjoy it. Though it must be noted, the cake is for all, and the excess, if one labels it as such, is spread to all things, to the environments, to all the folds on the clothing or the craggles on the witch blade. It's a more is more type of approach, which is appealing to some and not to others. For me, it lands particularly well because this is their world that they're creating, so all the characters look as though they were meant to be this way because, well, they are. It's it's different from, say, when Turner drew Supergirl. Now, this won't be for everyone. If one isn't here for the tropes or doesn't care about the Witchblade or finds Sarah annoying, this won't be for you. But for those who stuck with it, they were gifted with, for a time at least, a world of expanding lore and, for a time, tight creative team with a joint vision. There were some interesting crossovers, too. Witchblade and Vampirella. Of course, Witchblade in the Darkness, which would become more of a thing, more intertwined. Witchblade and Tomb Raider. Yes, please. So that was the first issue of Witchblade, and those were my thoughts. And now I want to hear yours. Were slash are you a fan of Witchblade? Do you think this issue holds up? Is this for you? Or no, get all this 90s out of here. It can take its grunge mixtape and go home. Tell me all the things down below, and thanks so much to Kami Koto for sponsoring this video. Please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell notification so that you never miss a video. Thanks so much for taking this to an area to spend discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it, and I'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.